Now I've got a pop filter so I can yeah, say my peas. Pop peas. Scotch. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 48 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the web st- thing. And I'm Sam, and I'm the fucking artist! And today is May 3rd, 2016. Sure. It could be any day. And before we get started, we have a warning. Anything could happen on this show, including lewdness, Profanity and nudeness. <laughs> I did just drop an F. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> for example, Sam might say "fuck" in the past. Yep. Yeah. So if you could just go Be back warned. and delete that from your brain. Yeah. Also, if you're a child, go away. Okay, let's get started, boys. Although boys. we have attached the explicit tag on iTunes now. Yeah. So what are you doing? Get so, out of here, kids. You scamps. Yeah. Scatterwags. Ugh. Also, we're all in the same room for the first time in a long time, and we all have nice mics. This is the first time we are in the same room with individual microphones. Well, my microphone looks kind of like, I'm going to go with E.T. Adam's got a... <laughs> Actually, I'm going to take a picture of this so we can send it out later. He's got a sweater. We can take it afterwards. He's got a sweater wrapped around a mic that is standing on top of a Kleenex box. It's Plus, also standing on top of another box. Yeah. So it's, it's... It's very precarious. DIY. It's a precarious mic. Yeah. Let's uh, hit yeah. the news. Adam's up here in St. Louis preparing for the move. Mm-hmm. The Great Migration. Yeah, we're we're going to have all of our studio in one place for the first time in forever. Literally, actually, mm-hmm. forever. And speaking of all of our studio, it's going to simultaneously grow. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a big announcement, which we put up on our blog today. But if, you, if you're not the reading type... You know, then uh, you can just listen to the podcast. Uh, we are bringing Carol Mertz into our studio, which is awesome. We're super pumped about it. We've known Carol for two years. Two We've two known Carol years. for years, <laughs> plural years. Um, a while. She's currently involved in a bunch of a bunch of projects. She works at an indie game studio and a web dev firm. She also has kickstarted and distributed her own uh, card game and designed that whole thing herself. And she's going to be coming on as we're we're kind of we're we're playing with title ideas. We're thinking something like Catalyst. Uh, her role will be something along the lines of she's going to take over a whole bunch of stuff that Sam currently yeah. does. Uh, so there's going to be lots of community management, marketing, uh, PR, business development, finding new new ways for us to use our IP. So, you know, if we wanted to do plushies or something like that, uh, that would be Carol would take care of that. So we can do all kinds of cool stuff now once she comes on board and she's going to be coming on in June. Mm-hmm. Anything else you guys want to say about that? It's going to be awesome. It's super it's, exciting. Mm-hmm. It's going to be it's going to be super rad. Um, and just for those of you who are who heard about our other job opening, uh, we are still hiring. We're still looking for a what we call a game mechanic. And we have a bunch of information about that over at jobs.bscotch.net. And the reason we're talking about it right now is because this is the last podcast before the registration closes. Yep. It's going to be closing on Friday, May 6th. Or rather, that's the last day, right? Yeah, I, th- I think can... we'll probably leave it open on Saturday. Okay. But it's basically... Secretly. Secretly. Yeah, so those of you listeners, you're in on the future secret. Future applicants are in on the secret. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and we've also. So I just want to say something about this position. We've gotten a number of of emails from people who are interested in applying, but then they say that they they you know maybe lack the confidence in their skills, or they aren't totally sure whether they should apply for whatever myriad reason. Um, just do it. Just, yeah. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, I think you should you know? probably know by now that we we hire more. We're going to be hiring much more for uh, fit and uh, potential than for actual skill level at the time. We want attitude. Hire. Yeah, you can bring your bring your sassiness to the table. If you're sassy and you feel like you can program games, pick up Game Maker, do some tutorials, and then apply for the job. Yeah, I mean we and we are also we're evaluating candidates in the context of their life. So, you know, if somebody says, hey, I've been making games for 10 years and then they go through this application process and if they don't demonstrate any skill at game dev, we're going to be like, well, clearly you haven't quite nailed it. Uh, (laughs) But if somebody says, hey, you know, like I really want to try this into something I've never done or maybe they're not even a programmer, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going to weigh that against how they perform on the coding test, for example. And we I mean, we have had applicants who don't have any programming experience and still did some really cool 
cool yeah. stuff in Knock the coding the test. Yep. Um, and of course, that's more impressive to us than somebody who's been doing it forever and you know barely did anything. So uh, yeah, just apply in the you know worst case scenario, nothing happens. Yeah, don't be self handicapping and yeah. be like, oh, I'm not gonna apply for the job because I might not get it. Yeah, yeah shut that, up. That makes yeah nothing makes less sense than that statement. It really doesn't make any sense. Nope. Yeah, so just apply and quit being a weenie. Mm. Mm. And okay, so let's talk about dying. Okay, so <laughs> so last week we ended up accidentally having a very intense discussion about about this concept of self handicapping and a motivation in general, uh, which kind of spun out of control for the first half of the podcast. But it's actually and so now we're talking about death. We're gonna yeah, we're gonna dive straight in because right. uh, we actually got more sort of community feedback on that little snippet of deep conversation that we had. Than a lot of the other stuff we talk about. I so, guess you guys just like us throwing philosophical bullshit around. Or so something. we figure, what better philosophical bullshit than death? So we're gonna dive right in, and the idea here comes from. Although death is real, I just wanna. It point, is super real. Point that out. It okay. is super real. So yeah. part of the motivation things come from the fact that you got to realize that you're gonna die. You're gonna die super hard someday, and up until that point, you can do whatever you want. But at some point, you're gonna die. Um, and this is this is weird. It's a weird fact to face, and most people actually don't have to deal with it hardly ever. Of course, uh, for us until instantly at some point. Yes, that's exactly right. They or until they're it. old and like constantly becoming closer to being dead. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so, well, I mean, that's always true, but it's more apparent. Yeah, but it becomes, yeah, it becomes more <laughs> apparent when like you're when you're literally just falling apart constantly. That's true. So we've of course had our own uh, brushes with it from my cancer diagnosis and the two year bullshit that that entailed. And I read this paper a few weeks ago that I thought was super interesting because it actually, it produced an even greater impetus to sort of do what you want with your life and to pick up, pick up whatever you got and get going. And the idea was, was about time perception. And so when we consider time perception, generally, we think about it with regards to a linear time scale, right? So one year and then another year. A year is a year, a day is a day. Right. Uh, Yet, while we measure it like that, the reality is that if you talk to pretty much anybody who's over the age of like 40, they'll say something about the fact that it seems like the years start whipping by by the time you're in middle age and then especially by the time you're essentially what you would call old, uh, the years kind of seem to somehow just melt. They just keep on going by really fast. And so in psychology, there's a uh, commonly referenced thing called the just noticeable difference, the JND. And it posits that, and it's true. The JND. It's not a great acronym. The JND suggests, and a bunch of psych studies have have bore this out, that most human sensations follow a log scale of being able to detect differences. So what that means is if you pick up a five pound weight and then a, say, a seven pound weight, you can pretty much tell the difference between the two. But if you pick up a hundred pound weight and then a hundred and seven or a hundred and two pound weight, for example, the The difference difference is the same. same. Yet. The absolute difference is the same, but the relative difference. Correct. Is small. And so what humans actually perceive is more about the relative difference in things. And this applies to light. It applies to uh, sound, a lot of decibel levels, all that sort of stuff. So this psychologist wrote this paper uh, with the idea being that perception of time itself. Also applies. Exactly. Would fall. Maybe, maybe that actually follows the same trajectory. And uh, over this over this past weekend, I went up to Iowa and visited visited the dads of the three of us and asked them for their their take on this idea, which is that essentially that as you get older, time will feel like it's passing more quickly because each each given year that you have is actually less of the pie of your whole life. And so as a result, it's experienced as less of that entirety. So the idea would be if you are the the gap between, say, age nine and 18 Mm -hmm. will feel the same to you as the gap between age 18 and 36. Right. So that's one of the ideas that he posits. And then 36 to 72. Exactly. And so you you actually end up stretching out uh, into these. If you were to stretch it out into equivalent buckets of perception of time, then what you end up having is that sort of scale happen where, say, from... From 9 to 18 is equivalent to 18 to 36 is equivalent to 36 to 72, as is a very rough example. Um, he doesn't say that that's actually what's happening, of course, because you, the problem is you can't empirically measure this. This is just this guy's sort of talking about this idea. And uh, the the interesting, I guess, point about this is if you think about it like that, then the reality is that your time actually goes by much, much quicker than your years would suggest, right? It's not the case that you have, say, 72 years of life. Really, you have like four of these, four, maybe six of these buckets of equal time perception that are roughly the equivalent of like you being from nine to 14, essentially, as far as what the density of the memory. Yeah. So I guess, I guess part of this kind of comes down to, I don't know, I don't know if it's about perceiving time or so much as remembering 
aging time or right. something. But yeah, so the idea would be if you're 30 years old and you're looking back on, you know, what your life was like as a 10 year old, that that distance in time for you is going to feel the same when you're 90 and looking back on when you were a 30 year old. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. Is that? I mean, that's the idea. I'm pretty sure though. There's another theory. What's that? Because because I agree, it is generally true that that the older people get, and this is true for me as well. That you look at time passing, you're like I'm just whipping by. Yeah. Right. And it just seems to be going fast. I remember. I remember when summer vacation, which was three months, felt like a long time. You were oh, just yeah. like, yeah. I have infinite time. I can do any, or even an hour. Like you, you know, you get off of school at three o'clock or whatever, whatever, four o'clock. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, I have the whole evening. I can do anything. You know, now <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, it's not well, the same anymore. <laughs> but here's, here's, here's a counter. Okay. Here's hit, my counter argument. Hit me, science man. Uh, so, and this isn't universally true, but it's pretty true that, that as you are growing up and developing as a human being, the number of things that happen to you and the number of ways that you change as a human being are really, really fast and in short succession at the beginning. Right. So getting like your and first they girlfriend. Get further and further apart. But even your things like your test. daily life, right? Because if you think about your daily life in like in school, right? You've got like six different classes you go to where like all of a sudden you're being taught a new worldview in each one. Or you're super and fucking pumped because you get to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch today. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Which you don't we've you've only done like eight times in your life. <laughs> right. Right. So so the things that you're it's doing. So <laughs> are relatively new. You haven't done them that much. And the diversity of things that you're doing is very high. So you're saying it's a it's a novelty fuel. It's a novelty fuel well, so, experience. Because as you get older, yes. you go to college and it's actually the same. And like college for me felt like it was moving pretty fast, but like I in the moment, it didn't feel like I was going fast. Like I remember it as being fast, but in the moment I was like, Oh my God, I've just mountains of work to do. Yeah. And it felt like I didn't have enough time, but that's because the things that I had to do in college weren't things that you do in 45 minute periods. They were things like there's this entire course where you're, you know, reading one massive piece of literature and writing an epic paper on it. And so my life wasn't divided into 45 minute segments anymore. My life was divided into a fucking three month segment. Right. Right. And now, and then, and then my PhD, it was like divided into a year long segments and now it's divided into game development long segments which span six One, six months, months to, to two three years, years. Yeah, right. and and those are now those are the milestones right or like or me moving to st louis now after being in dallas for the past seven years right, right. So there, so there's, so there's the not as much stretch. turbulence there's just not much turbulence and as you get older like the whole goal of getting older is to basically stabilize your life by generating huge amounts of, of or generating as much wealth as you can buying a house and settling down having kids and settling down further but then the and, few Fewer new experiences the you have. new experiences you have. So perhaps... You, okay, well, wait, I have to say. Yeah. Have you guys seen the movie Click? Yeah. It's, I have not, but I know it is it. the. It was an ambush of sadness. Yeah. I'm still upset about it's it. It's an Adam Sandler day. movie, and I remember watching the previews, and they were hilarious. Okay, well, it, was the, I mean, it was the first one he did where he went from being just totally goofy to really serious, yeah, serious and nobody was switch. prepared... I was not prepared. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I, when I heard about, when I read this article and heard about this idea of sort of time moving faster, um, I kind of connected it to the idea of, is, which we kind of talked about last week, but the idea of habit formation and how basically the human brain. Right. You're automates more an things. autopilot. Yeah. The human yeah. brain automates things the more it experiences them. Right. So the third time you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you're like, Oh my God. You know, but the 330th time. And you didn't even know how to make that peanut butter and yeah. jelly sandwich. And like by the time you get into the hundreds of doing the same, same thing over and over in your life. Um, you just don't even notice it happening. The marginal yeah. utility of that thing is low. Is I, have, I mean, I have recently made and eaten a sandwich and then not remembered, not remembered it. I, I, yeah. had, I had to look at yeah. the sink for the dirty silverware you ever, you ever to do clarify. That thing? You ever do that thing where you are in the shower and then all of a sudden, like you kind of blank out for a moment and then you're like, did I wash my head? Oh, yeah, or, that happens <laughs> to me all the time. Yeah, yeah like, oh, fuck it, I guess I just got to do it again. I have no <laughs> idea. Or then you, yeah. like, you go somewhere and you're like, did I put on deodorant today? I have no memory of anything. Yeah, so I don't think it's that you, I don't think it's that you perceive time as moving faster. I think it's that you don't you're notice You're just on things. autopilot all the time. Which is exactly, like, that's the, actually the premise of that movie is like he gets this magical remote from the Beyond section of Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't remember who gives it to him. Some it's of, Christopher some Walken. Christopher Walken, I think. <laughs> ah. And uh, of course it is. But he but he does exactly this, where it's basically like anytime there's a part of his life that he's just kind of tired of doing, he just uses this remote to fast forward it and and just like reappear on the other side of it, having done it sort of on autopilot. But then the remote starts to learn what he 
chooses to fast forward and it starts automatically doing it for him. So what you're saying is, is the, that is your that brain is already even, doing that. Yeah. yeah. Is that, that's actually just reality. That's just how it works. Which and is as really sad, sad as it was in that movie, that's how sad you should be <laughs> about your life in general right now. <laughs> well, so there's, but there's a, there's an interesting, there's a cure there. Well, there's a bunch of interesting things here. One is that the striving only toward, uh, points of security, which is what a lot of us do, either in your means job, you're gonna die faster. It actually, yeah, it literally means I mean, it'll feel like it. it'll feel like you're gonna <laughs> die faster. So that means that you need to build in time to do new stuff. For one, um, the other one is, and I, I found this interesting from just having from uh, doing more sketching from past week is I find that you really don't you don't you haven't actually seen something in my opinion until you've sat down to draw the shit out of it for like thirty minutes. Because the reality is, if you ask most people to draw like someone's face, they'll get like, it'd be half right. Most people, and this is actually true in a psych study, most people can't actually put all of the keys on a keyboard in the proper order. Despite Adam the fact. can. Yeah. <laughs> Adam's keyboard doesn't even have any letters oh, yeah. on it. Nope. It's just it's totally blank. blank. <laughs> <laughs> but most people actually can't. But I, I can't, can't do, do it. it. I have to do it by by typing out the letters and like, I have to type yeah. them out physically in space and be like, okay, which one goes it's under all muscle this memory. finger? Yeah, it's all muscle memory. So I have to make my mo- my my muscles recall my mom. the memories to actually find it. Well, there's so there's an interesting idea, right? Which is that uh, to like you need to you have to this present idea of of being mindful, which is sort of swept all over the place. I think is a bit of a push against this idea, which is that everyone's always pushing for more and more security. But the reality is that being very secure should really be the foundation for you being kind of a nut about other stuff, right? Like you get being able to have a house and being able to have like a lot of friends and stuff should allow you to take more risks with other activities or, you know, put together a group to go whitewater rafting yeah, or something. There's, security, there's no point yeah. in security if you then don't get to take a risks and use that as a net. Exactly. So security for the sake of security, a bunch of bullshit. And you want to make sure you're always sort of grabbing the next thing and learning something else from it. And I think it was interesting talking to the dads about it because Kevin said that the last, the only new, new thing he remembers from this year was going and shooting a bow and arrow in Forest Park here in St. Louis in the middle of a cold, freezing rain. And I was like, how was it? You know, it's one sort of your one milestone from this year. And he was like, it's miserable. But, I, but, I, <laughs> but, but you I remember. But you remember it happening. Yeah. 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 And the thing is, you know, those things stick out in your mind. And the more you do the same stuff over and over again, the less you have to look back on and remember. And so you just don't remember it. And again, this this does come back to what we did. We did talk about this last week with the motivation piece. But I found with with that uh, that element of hitting a good enough point with the art that I had sort I had stopped pushing myself in a way in a wide variety of ways. And even like just this afternoon, I developed an interesting little twist on the art style that we've been using that I actually like a lot. And that's actually based on the sketches that I've been doing the past week. And I feel really good about it. And I remember today. It's cool. I made new stuff today. And it's not just new things that look the same as everything else. And I think there's one other other point to this that I want to bring up from a psych standpoint that most people maybe wouldn't uh, think about right away. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between your present self and your remembered self. And there's this interesting problem in psych, and it actually has sort of ethical quandaries associated with it, which is that your present self wants certain things, and your remembered self, your sort of narrative self, wants actually a separate set of things. And the easiest example of this that they did was they found there were two surgery techniques that you could perform on a patient. And they basically gave the patient a little pain dial because they're awake the whole time and they can, they measure the output of the amount of pain they have, right? So over the course of the operation, they're able to then track the total, like the accumulation of pain, spikes in pain, that sort of thing. Between these two operations, one of them actually caused less pain overall to the present self, right? The person who was moving the thing. Sure. But it ended with a spike. The other operation caused more pain overall, but slowly declined in the amount of pain that was perceived. Wait, wait. Cumulative pain? Correct. Can you just add pain together? Sure, using calculus. But yeah. what if it's a logarithmic unit? It might be. It probably is. But I, yeah, so I mean, like, how do you know, I mean, I don't know that the cumulative pain over one was really more pain? And what does that even mean? I don't know. <laughs> but just roll with it for a moment. Okay, I'll roll, roll with it. it. So sure. continue. So the point is that in one circumstance, you can optimize for uh, a patient literally experiencing less pain during the operation presently. Just kind of threw out. But the problem is they give they give worse ratings about the surgery and about the hospital experience than if they get the other surgery, which technically causes them more pain, if we're believing the measurement. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, technically causes them more pain, but ends in a way that is essentially more more uh, appropriately remembered or remembered more positively by the person. So this time dilation thing is the same thing, right? Because the reality is your moment 
moment to moment experience of time doesn't change. Like, I don't feel like my moment to moment experience of typing or doing anything. It doesn't, that doesn't feel faster, but the remembered piece does. Right. And so the question is like, how do you find something that both, you know, you don't necessarily want to torture yourself in the present moment to remember stuff, I guess is based on Kevin's archery moment. Like you don't want to be standing out in the cold all the time. That's right. Hmm. So you got to always on. end on a high note. Food for thought. Yeah. From butterscotch. Okay. Yeah. So the moral of the story is do a bunch of new stuff all the time or you're going to be instantly dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is pretty much it. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, let's get to some questions <laughs> on that note. What do we got, Sam? All right. So uh, first question I want to take actually comes from Blake Buck in all caps. Blake Buck. Blake Buck. I, I want to throw out there that anybody who's B-Scotch ID is in all caps is just nailing it. They're doing it right. Yeah. You know? Doing it right. What living, if living life in all caps? What if their B Scotch ID is all lowercase in all caps? As long as it's that not, would be acceptable, also. Okay. As long as it's not camel case. But what if it's camel case in all caps? That'd be fine. Camel camel case in all caps. Yeah. So it's camel the word camel caps. case, but it's in all caps. Or that, it's all this caps, is, the word, but in camel case. <laughs> this is this is off. This is reminds me of that uh, rocket jump. Uh, yeah, the password. Wi-Fi password video, which yeah. people should look up. But anyways, yes. <laughs> uh, so this question comes uh, from the art and motivation stuff from last week. Blake Buck asks, uh, Sam recently spoke of his hangups and considering himself an artist. And I've worked in AAA game dev for five years, but until recently, I've never pursued my own project. Do you have any tips for other artists of utility like yourself? Software technique, other stuff. Uh, and I want to ask your guys' opinion on it, too, because the truth is so Seth actually did a bunch of art himself for his own projects, probably more so in the capacity you're talking about because he's programming at the same time. Whereas I just kind of came on and started doing art by itself. So I want to ask Seth about it. Yeah, well, it's definitely much more fun and enjoyable to make art that feels like it's going to be part of something else, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's much more motivating to be like, oh, I need to make a character that's running along the ground or, you know, whatever, instead of just drawing something and then being like, well, I did, I drew that, and then just walk away, I guess, for the mm -hmm. rest of the day. Um, yeah, so if you actually pick up, try to pick up a little bit of programming or something, it might be... So you can bring your work to life. Mm, yeah, because you, you'll be picking up a new skill as well as you know and then you'll also give yourself more of a reason to sort of refine your existing skill set with art and uh from a personal perspective i actually did solo game dev for 18 months before doing anything with a group and having the understanding of like how art fits together into the game and how to animate things and all that um was super helpful when sam came along because sam hadn't really done that side of things and so he didn't quite know like how to approach it but since I had all that experience, then I could kind of like show him how to put the art, the sprites together and stuff, uh, you know, kind of early on. Yeah. And now, of course, he knows everything. But so if but if you already have uh, programming experience, like you might. We don't when you say you've been a triple A game dev for five years, that could mean a literally things. anything. So yeah, if we assume that you do know programming already, uh, then just as far as software goes, uh, we we just use the program Inkscape, which is a free vector program. And the reason I use that is because it's free. having not as much free <laughs> and then also having not been able to draw in the past, it acts more like a sculpting tool. So you can make tons of mistakes and just sort of wiggle stuff around until it gets right. And on top of that, the best technique is really just to stop giving a fuck. As much yeah. as possible. It's an advanced technique, though. Yeah, it does. It, weirdly, it takes practice. Takes about. You can listen to the song by John LaJoey. What's that called? I think it's called uh, "Fuck Everything." Yeah. yeah. Or is uh, it just called "I Don't Give a Fuck"? No, that's a different one. That's yeah. by that's by, by George Watts. All oh, right. Yeah. So Which listen is also to good. yeah, listen to John LaJoey's "I Don't Give a Fuck" and then Watsky's. No, other way. Right. Yeah, John LaJoey's "Fuck Everything." Fuck everything. <laughs> <laughs> Watsky's "I Don't Give a Fuck," and then also and then John LaJoey's. I started as a baby. There's yeah. also a great book called The Life-Changing Magic of Not Giving a Fuck. <laughs> I'm yeah. serious. That is a book. Have you read it? I have. It's pretty good. Is it pretty good? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to give a fuck, but whatever. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I would suggest honestly listening to those songs and sort of taking the idea, just take just take it in. Let open yourself up and let the lack of fucks fill you like with like nothing, with nothing. in a in and then a just case. make stuff. Yeah, just start making stuff because uh, who once gives you, a fuck? Well, who gives a fuck? And once you start loosening up about it and you don't worry so much uh, about the overall quality, you'll start making weird and interesting things, and then you can kind of repeat that from there. So that's that's my best my best advice is that I could give. Nice. Thanks. Um, okay, this one comes from Map Five Five Nine Seven, who asks. What is the most complicated programming problem each of you has had to implement? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which one? Was, which was the most complicated program problem, and which was the most fun? Okay, uh, I have an unconventional answer. Seth, okay, go. Okay, every programming problem that you solve is probably the most complicated one 
at the time. And then in retrospect, it was super easy <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, none of it true. makes, none of it makes any goddamn sense until it's done. And then you're like, Oh, okay. I get it. I get it. Like with Crashlands, I had to learn how to use Perlin noise. And I spent a week reading articles and trying to like figure out what people were saying about it. And then at one point it, it kind of clicked and I was like, okay, I think I get the basic concept, but I'm just going to ignore all the details that people have thrown into these articles because it's super confusing. Uh, and then I just created my own version of it. And then it was actually really straightforward, but it took a week for me to get to a point where it was really, really simple and easy to understand. Isn't it the so. case that when you were doing that, you there was some part of the equation that everyone's like, and this leads to, and they just skipped something yeah. that was sort of integral. Once again, it's like that that goddamn, that, you know, here, draw two circles, now draw the rest of the owl. You know, <laughs> like, right. like, what's what's going on in the middle there? They're like the important bits. Uh, but yeah, so right now, I think the complicated program or programming issue that I'm working on is uh, local multiplayer over, right. over wireless network, over home network. Which um, does answer one of the other questions, which is, are we going to make a multiplayer game? Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're, we're talking we're, about it. Code name brunch. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk too much about the details as far as what the game mechanics are gonna be because they're really in flux right now. But what I'd like what I'd like to do is still do the cross platform thing where, you know, it will be released on mobile and PC and whatever. Um, but because we can do this sweet uh, same game on multiple device configurations thing. We want to try to get it to where you can like play it on your phone with somebody who's playing it on a PC on the same network, which would be yeah. super cool. Super cool. No promises. I mean, but like that is working and that's easy to do. It's mostly a question of will the game be good? Yeah, the game. <laughs> It's a, it's a game problem. The game has to be very playable on both of those. Yeah, devices. it's not a tech problem. It's a design problem. Can I just yeah. say that? So going back to one of your early points about this uh, this vagueness that sort of inhabits a lot of tutorials and things. Yeah. When it comes to trying to do something, uh, I think there's a good stand up guy where he's talking about the laziest writing is when they say. And one thing led to another. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like how fu- it's a story. Like in that's, that case, that's what just existing means. Like, yeah. Everything leads to another thing. It's just hilarious. And I feel like that does happen a lot in tutorials and stuff. And you got to figure out how to yeah. fill the gap on that. Yeah. Well, right. the other difficult part is, of course, the tutorial is written by somebody who, for them, it's a simple thing. It's because they understand it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like how you, when you design a game and you automatically tend to make it much harder than it needs to be because you've played it and you understand how everything works. And then you put it in the hands of a new player and they have just no clue what to do and they just suck and they just die a whole right. bunch. You know, it's the same thing with everything. All right, Adam, what about you? I actually, the, that's a good answer. I mean, it's, it would be the same because I was looking back and I was like, I don't, I can't think of anything complicated I've done, but it, I've done a lot of stuff that was definitely complicated. Mm-hmm. But you know? once you've done it, you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. My, maybe speaking of this whole memory. <laughs> and then you hurtle toward right? oblivion even faster. <laughs> well, but I mean, the last part of each one of those things I remember is when it was done. Yep. Right? yep. That was the note that I ended on. Yeah. And so I don't remember the pain of not understanding how it works. So you're saying you've never gotten perma stuck on anything. If I have, I didn't give a shit. No, you don't give a fuck. I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did something else. You're or, like, wow, I'm stuck on this problem. Well, I don't give a fuck. I'll just keep working on it. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> it hasn't been the case that I can rem- that I can really think of that I've been confronted with a problem that I didn't eventually figure out or find a workaround that was sufficient. Most of the time, it's workarounds, like it's, the whole banana yeah, often arms workarounds. situation. Yeah, yeah. Well, even I was making a piece of software last night uh, for for Sam, just like a little utility software, and there was something I really needed to do that I really needed to be a property of the program I was using, and it just didn't have that property. And I like banged my head on it for half an hour, and all of a sudden I was like, you know, there's a dumb way to do this. Let's do it the dumb way. <laughs> and I did it the dumb way, and it's sufficient. I like, love the idea of a workaround, because yeah. the idea of a workaround implies, like, you have point A and B, there's clearly a straight path between yeah, them, right? Yeah, but for some reason, At there's some, some shit point, in the way. There's something in the way, and you're like, no, let's go around it. Yeah, the reality <laughs> is, when you, yeah, when you come in across an obstacle, you got you got a couple options, right? You can brute force your way through it. You can devise some method to sort of leap over it, or you can just maybe just go around, walk it. around it, just pretend you know, like it's not there. The walls don't go on forever. Very rare. Yeah. And I mean, really, it, you know, yeah, okay, it's not the optimal path. It's gonna take a little bit longer, a little bit more leg work. Who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> now we should say that if you're working in an industry like uh, aviation, you should probably give a fuck. You should probably give a fuck. Nah, even then, then, I got some. Fr- I have some friends who do aviation for stuff and you would be shocked at the amount of true. not yeah. giving a fuck that goes on not to make you feel unsafe when you're in an autopilot but you should be terrified <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, you should remember, every time you use anything, Always some bring, human designed oh, that so thing. Wait, can I tell you? And that person didn't know what they were doing, and they probably used work I was here. walking down the road yesterday, and you would not fucking believe what I saw. Um, I'm, wait, I, take a guess. A goat ghost. <laughs> That is, so, that is so shockingly unrelated to I, any- I wouldn't believe it, which was, I think, the requirement. Oh, I did not see a goat ghost. That would have been well, amazing. Is this going to be better than goat ghost? Wait, is it ghost goat or goat ghost? It's a goat ghost. What's the... Oh, actually, let me think about that. Ghost goat. Goat ghost? Goat ghost? Which one's, goat. The, which one's the adjective, goat or ghost? <laughs> I think actually a ghost goat and a goat ghost. Can we get some English majors thing. to write in and let us know? Is it goat ghost or ghost? It's got to be the same thing. <laughs> All right, so I was walking down the goddamn road. But what if it was a goatly ghost versus a ghostly you goat? Shut your goat. Those are different. <laughs> Adam, you gotta be you gotta be kidding me. The, <laughs> go, go on, Sam. What's your uh, what's your situation? Anyway, so I was walking down the road and there's a mower going. Okay, a mower. Yet there's no one riding this mower. It's basically a mower. So Roomba. you saw a ghostly goat? No, I saw mowing. There may have been a goat a lawn. ghost atop of it, but there is a there is a robot mower mowing someone's lawn. That's literally a death machine. It is, but it had no like motor. It, I think it was just a kind of like as you push, like when I got the push mower thing, the manual. So it, it made very little noise. So it's just creepy. So it's silent and deadly. And my favorite part about it was it was clearly like super dumb. And I'm not sure how it had mounted. <laughs> <laughs> while we were watching, while we were watching this poor robot just doing its thing, uh, it. It like bumped into a bunch of stuff and then turned and it had gone over the same like little stripe of path clearly like four times. <laughs> and then it almost drove into the street and like detected that it was about to fly off the curb and then turned and then didn't quite turn enough. It was just hilarious to watch and the dog Jocko got very sort of antagonistic with this thing too. So it was this weird robot organic creature square off situation. I like to imagine that the mower was kind of sad. It that it couldn't like that it couldn't do a very good job. You know that situation in a, <laughs> in Rick and Morty. Do you show me with the the, the, butter, the robot? butter robot? Yeah, yeah. Oh, tell, yeah. tell him about that. Tell him the, the butter story. robot. I will, no, I'll just just watch Rick you and Morty. Watch Rick and Morty. But there, here's a, here's a real life example mm. of this though. The which one is it? I want. I believe the Curiosity rover. Every mm-hmm. year on its birthday, it sings itself happy birthday, <laughs> <laughs> all by its fucking self. On Mars. on Mars, and of course, the birthday song doesn't carry very far because there's almost no. no so atmosphere. just like, just picture that in your mind. There's a little robot, there's a little bubble of song around it. Yeah, just making that. Like, and if you were like, you like, imagine being miles away, just like hearing it faint, faintly. <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining <laughs> that it's in a minor key, and that it, it sounds like Wally. Yeah, it's it's got to sound like Wally. Shit. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. And that they never programmed it to do that. Oh my god! All right, so this uh, next question comes from Gafferman. <laughs> Which is, what's the most interesting game mechanic you've experienced in a game? What about not in a game? Can we go there real quick? Ooh, game mechanic in real life? Yeah. So legislation is basically various rules. I was going to go with goatly ghost driving. Yeah, laws laws are patch notes for society. So they're patches. What's the most interesting game mechanic you've experienced in real life or in a video game? And or real life. I'll answer the video game one while you guys mull over the real life one real quick. How's that? Okay. So um, I think as far as recently, I really liked though it felt a little gimmicky, but very cool. The super hot mechanic, which uh, took the FPS and just made it so that while you were time only moved while you moved, which is also a weirdly easy thing to explain to someone, even though it makes zero fucking sense. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't played that, at least watch some videos of it because people pull off some extreme ninja matrix stuff, which is super fun to watch. But yeah, yeah, I mm. would say so to the to the actual game game mechanic. These would both be cliche, probably, but when they happened, without a doubt, they were phenomenal. Mm. So those would be Portal. Mm. Yeah. Which, oh, yeah. I mean, there was nothing like that at that time, except for the game that it was sort of based on. But uh, Narbacular Drop. Narbacular Drop, which I also played while I was waiting for Portal to come out. I uh, did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. It was good. And, uh, and then the other one would be Braid, because there have been other games that have done similar kind of time mechanic things, but nothing that close to that well. Right. And and it just crushed it so hard that that, and, and you know, thinking of puzzle design from that kind of a mechanic perspective, like I would never want to do that in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried to make a puzzle game in the past and it, it didn't pan out for me Project, or anyone. Project actually. 87. Project, oh, yeah. Project 87. I think it's, it's, it's still floating around on the internet. Didn't it get somewhere. translated into Japanese for some reason and like yeah got approached by a, a company and they're like hey we'll, we'll translate it into japanese and i was like all right and then they did and now it's for sale in japan i don't know how it's doing because i haven't 
collected any royalty checks, <laughs> you should I haven't you should asked. send a man an email about that. I mean, I assume it's huge in Japan. I don't, yeah, I mean, obviously. I don't know. Yeah. It's Project A7. For me, a real-life game mechanic that's really interesting is electricity hmm. because I, I don't fully understand it yet. I feel like it has a lot of depth. I feel like fire is <laughs> sort of the same for me, you know? Yeah, like, what's it doing? What? What's, Fuck. It, what's going on there? What? It just destroys <laughs> it. I feel like, <laughs> what? But you can also put meat on it and make and hamburgers. <laughs> Yeah. If contained, it's your friend. If uncontained, it's your worst enemy. It's yeah. Ele- electric- yeah, it. like, yeah, electricity will, will kill you, and it shoots out of the sky. But also, it somehow like makes computer screens go. And like we're turning our voices into electricity right now, and then we're going to put that into some other electricity, send that over a bunch of wires, and then other people are going to hear us talking because of electricity. Yeah. I don't understand any of this. It is very cool. I guess... For me, I'd have to say the game mechanic is is programming other people with my words. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because all I you can just is, make people react and do stuff. Yeah. The, the fact is, like, know. anytime you talk to somebody, you're controlling their fucking mind. And of course, anytime they talk to you, they're doing the same thing. So <laughs> well, it's there's, a trade off. There's some give and take. There's there. give and take. Yeah. I mean, we're all. But the thing is, well, because that's how social stuff works, right? So the fact is, you can do you can accomplish anything you want to by just programming other people by slapping your this little like meat thing slapping your, your meat and your tubes. neck together your meat tube just like <laughs> flappy <laughs> flap and then all of a sudden somebody else is like yeah okay I'm gonna go do this thing you just requested you're like hey uh, could you uh, grab me a, a, quick, a cup of tea yeah, real quick it's pretty and I'd be like sure and then it's pretty now you have tea yeah uh, but then <laughs> To extend that, you can just you can make anything around you happen pretty much just by talking to other humans about it. Yeah, it's pretty weird. It's just super weird. Yep. I think uh, for me, I like to think of the social social mechanics. So you know your your various quiet rules for interacting with people, which I think are always fun to to pay attention to. And the best one, of course, is that from a just from a psych perspective too, is that if you mimic someone else's behavior even just a little bit in a conversation, then they like you more. Yeah, right. Match their tone. Their it's a little like match three puzzler. Every day of your life, <laughs> what? you do it subconsciously. Are there any psych studies about what happens when you crush someone's hand into powder when you shake their hand? Do they like you more when that happens? I think I have generally not liked it when that happens to me. There are some. <laughs> Some people take that idea of having a firm handshake just a little too fucking far. Yeah, there's a opinion. there's a difference between firm and like vice grip. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a there's a line there, and you don't want to cross it. Yeah. All right. Next question comes from Racing for the Finish, and this is about the game mechanic position. Given that it's been up for the world to apply to for two weeks now, have there been any surprises or fun stories that come up related to the game mechanic position? Um, yeah, we, we can, can be careful. What we can't say. share most things. Yeah, no. I, I can speak generally. The thing that has actually really surprised me the most, and I, I did not. Ex- I mean, I kind of thought this might happen, but it was a weird, wild guess. Uh, is that people with a lot of programming experience are having a really hard time with Game Maker? And well, maybe it's with, just yeah. your code. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, it's basically the the more experience somebody has with traditional programming. Um, the harder time they seem to be having with uh, with the programming test. Yeah. And inversely, people with no programming experience aren't having too much trouble at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yeah. It's uh, did not really expect that to be the case. Yeah. Well, kind of did, but I, just not to that to the extreme that we've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. You'd think that somebody who who could think like a programmer who's trained that way. Yeah. Would be able to sort of you know parse it out and figure out how things work and then yeah you know, I do adapt think to though, the system. I mean, I think because since most programmers know lots of languages. Languages and they've been exposed to lots of different stuff. I think it's probably true that given some, because it's a, it's a very time constrained coding mm-hmm. test that we that we have in this thing. I think given some more time, like you know, eat like a few days of like real real world work, I think they'd get over those hurdles probably. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, having that short, they would have a window, much higher skill cap out of the gate than somebody who doesn't right, have any programming yeah, right. experience. So, so they'll have like a, they'll have a, st- yeah, exactly. Cause like what we saw from the people who didn't have much programming experience was their peak performance. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. What we saw from people who were good programmers was actually like on the low, like far on the low end of their experience probably. Yeah. Uh, which actually it was, cause it's interesting. Cause that means it was, it wasn't as good of a test as we kind of thought it was mm-hmm. probably. On the other hand, maybe it was cause we were testing for lots of things. With we're testing for lots of other yeah. things. Because it's yeah, it's a it's a totally self directed coding test. It's, it's not like we say solve this problem. I mean, we're just handing a game to people and being like, make it better. Yeah, I think the the thing that's been surprising to me about the whole process is, I mean, I think we've had a we've had a really high number of what seem like really high quality candidates. 
which is really cool and kind of surprising since we didn't spread the net out too far. And on top of that, the reading of the essays. So there's there's this idea that you, anything you do, like how you walk, what art you choose for your house, how your handwriting looks, sort of splatters your personality around a little bit, right? And so if you, this is the reason why the idea of metadata is is super obviously dangerous because you're sort of <laughs> yeah, you can learn a lot about a person just from looking, without actually looking at them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so having people answer even just a series of essay questions and then also looking at their, say, a cover letter that they chose to write and the choices they made in these things, you actually you start getting a really interesting sort of whole vibe of a person pretty quickly. Yeah. And how they and how they frame problems. Yeah. It's very interesting. So I've been yeah. I've been enjoying that a lot. Uh, well, and also uh, how and we were talking about this a little bit, too, how the, the person that someone presents themselves to be uh, wears off over it time. wears off over time. So like. Because we have, it's a pretty extensive uh, application process that takes place over it's very over extensive. days at, <laughs> yeah. at the fastest, right? Yeah. Um, for for most people right now, it's been like basically a couple of weeks. Uh, and of course, that's not like full time working on it. It's just doing a piece on one day and then three days later doing another piece. Um, but people aren't maintaining the what they showed us at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, everything that we are doing in this application process has been thought out with the the pure end goal of determining who each applicant really is and what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of those aspects is the longer you expose yourself to, you know, we figure like anybody can sort of put on a mask, like a social mask and sort of blend in with a crowd and, uh, you know, really like take a lot of time and double check what they say and their grammar and everything. But the more things you ask them to do and the longer you're exposed to that person, the more their true personality starts it's to show through. They become, yeah, they become more authentic. Um, and that's really the the whole point of like why this application process is that long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's been very interesting. It's fun. Yeah. fun little, it's, been, it's been funny yeah. to see like people who took a lot of time on the essays clearly in terms of, you know, uh, making sure that everything was meticulous grammar wise and everything. And by the time they get further along in the process, it's just like a little hairy. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. It's just Literally wild. Done. It's just wild, frantic typing. You yeah. know, it's, it's funny. It's interesting. All right. Next question comes from, comes from Ulmer Averne. And this is an interesting one, which I'll explain the concept of to you guys. Uh, so the question is, what about the quote, no sales promise label? It kind of sounds like what you're willing to do, which is not putting on crash lands, crash lands on sale for a while. Uh, and so the, the rough idea of the no sales promise is some indie developers came up with this where it's basically a price tag that you put on your game that says, like it's an icon of a price tag that says no sale, which it basically just means it's not going to go on sale for, I think it, the rules are, it's supposed to be like a generic standard. So you'd put this on your game if you're not going to put it on sale for like six months or something like that. Yeah. Um, the, well, yeah, you're supposed to put an expiration date on the no sale yes, tag. Yes, that's right, right. Uh, so you basically say, I'm not going to put it on sale until November or whatever the hell. And they are trying <laughs> to sort of like pull a bunch of people onto this, this thing. And I, I wanted to hear what you guys thought of that, the general concept and what implications it might have for any given indie developer. I think this would only conceivably do anything if it did anything, if the promise was no sale forever. Yeah. Cause I as soon as you go, I'm not putting this game on sale until November, then everybody's gonna be like, <laughs> I'll just wait till November. Yeah. I, th I think if, if someone is unwilling to buy, your game the first time they hear about it which will probably be around launch day right because they want to wait until it's on sale that person will literally wait forever right. and until it's on sale and more importantly they're gonna forget about your game within a week mm -hmm. if they haven't already bought it and played it because the entire world will forget about your game a week after it launches like i it's fucking unbelievable how quiet the world is about crashlands right now oh, right? Yeah. there yeah. are right now about four million people most of them pirates who have <laughs> who have installed and played crashlands and and several and a couple hundred thousand uh, who I guess what? Yeah, we have a couple hundred thousand B Scotch IDs, like people mm -hmm. who like liked it enough to log into the game, right? And we had a flurry of activity right at right at launch, and in a couple weeks after, and now it's just just Quiet. dead. We Quiet. get almost people are just, they played it, they enjoyed, yeah, and then they moved it on. basically doesn't exist. <laughs> Which, which is, is fair. I mean, it's not a, it's yeah. not a, we often use the term hobby game, which is something like, you know, League of Legends or Warframe, MMO, or you know, kinds of games. basically games where you build up a big social network inside the game. And then you just every, like it becomes your hobby. So every day you come back and you keep playing the same game over and over again. Yeah. And Crashlands just is not that. It wasn't designed to be that. It's a single player experience. It has an ending. So once you're done with it, you just don't have anything to talk about yep. with people. Yeah. So. And so what that means is not only so so basically everyone forgets about your game. Right. 
And so if, if when they sell your game, you're like, oh, I'm not going to put this on sale for a long time. They'll just be like, OK, I guess I'll buy it far in the future. But it doesn't matter because whether it's three months or a year, the person has forgot about your game for that entire period of time. Right. The, the weird thing about this to me is I asked myself after seeing it, I was like, what problem, what imaginary problem is this solving? Because yes, games go on sale pretty quickly, but the reality is, so I, I think it, it kind of, it points to the fact that a lot of players view devs and indie devs in, still in the same bucket as being like greedy in some regard. When of course, in reality, most people are just floundering around trying not to die. And so the, like the no sales promise to me seems like it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be like an ethical hedge, right? Where you're like, look, we're not putting this on sale because we believe in whatever the quality of the game or like we're not going well, to... I don't people... even think... But I don't even think... Cause I, I mean, I certainly there are going to be some players who are like, going on sale is just a money grab because they love using that word anytime they're annoyed. Anytime somebody, somebody makes money. Anytime somebody makes money. <laughs> uh, but the vast majority of players, it seems to me, don't have any sort of like emotional attachment whatsoever to a negative one to a sale they're just like fuck yeah now i can get this game cheap yeah right it seems to me the only purpose of having a no sale promise is just to tell people too bad you're not gonna be able to get this game cheap like you can with all other games in the next three months right so you should just buy it full so price. you should just buy it or too bad yeah, the right? question is if people would people turn around and then be and then just buy I guess the yeah, I mean, for me i'm like is, no, i doubt it it doesn't I, make a positive like this Promising not to give a sale to your players is not a positive promise. Right. I guess it's what's weird about it. Yeah. It, it certainly caters to that that one extremely vocal and annoying group of people who were like, oh, it's on sale. You money grabbing a bought it last week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and these, these are the people who, when you like launch your game and you're pumped about it, and you go talk about it on Reddit. You know, nobody will talk to you except for these people because these are the people who are super pumped about new games. And these people will tell you this is this is all bad. It's bad if you do this. It's bad if you do that. When the fact is, they're representing a very small minority opinion. It's actually great for your game to go on sale. Yeah. Yep. Because then more people <laughs> will buy it, more people will play it, and as long as that sale price still can provide as long revenue. as revenue, yeah, as long as you don't do something like put it on sale for eight cents. Yeah. That's too. That's too much. By that's too e.g., much putting sale. it into a bundle. Yeah. Don't be bundle. wary of bundles. Don't bundle it. Yeah. Ever. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Gaffer men again get men again who asks how do you feel about using kickstarter and or patreon to fund creative work game development in particular and is that something you'd make use of in the future i hate it why do you hate it i got i got wait do you do you hate the idea of it or do you hate the idea of doing it <laughs> mm. i hate the idea of doing it okay i'm, I'm cool with people using kickstarter yeah yeah i don't want to i don't want to use kickstarter i mean but i guess as a corollary yeah if that's the right word. How many Kickstarters have you backed? Mm, maybe like four. How many Patreons have you backed? One. Yeah. What, what about you? What do you got? What are you going for? I what? have backed, I think, like eight or nine Kickstarters. Okay, it's actually a good number. And two. Well, because what patrons. I'm getting at here is, what's your point? Adam? Is even if you're not like actively hostile towards it, you clearly aren't really into it as a thing. Like you know, you, that's not a way that you as a consumer used to support creative works. Yeah. Well, it, to me, to me, it all comes down to what it's all for. And yeah, uh, there are there are a lot of Kickstarter projects. Let's see, how do I put this? Having the ability to to sell an idea really well without having anything actually done um, allows you to get to blow projects dramatically out of scope. Yeah, on sure. Kickstarter, and you see this time and time again. Like there was a, a game. I'm going to use that term super loosely, not in like walking simulator sense, but in like it was more of a game mechanic. Yeah, uh, that was put up by. By uh, Neil Stevenson, who is the mm -hmm. author who made Ream D. And a jillion other of the best books. And this is an eloquent guy, you know, like when he talks. You're and like, really smart. Yeah, when he speaks, you're like, ooh, I, feel I like where this is going. <laughs> doesn't matter what he's saying. Yeah. And and he decided that the problem with modern gaming was the fact that anytime they're sword fighting, it's not realistic. I don't know what that means, but that was the problem that he was trying to it's solve. A very, it's extremely specific. It's a problem. real specific problem. <laughs> but the way he presented it in his Kickstarter video, it was like I watched it and I was like, "This is a problem. <laughs> we need as a society, we need to do something about this." <laughs> and his video was fantastic. Had great production yeah, value. I remember it. Um, and they had this big list of, you know, things that they needed to raise money for, for their Kickstarter. Cause they were going to make a game. It was all about sword fighting. And sure enough, they raised, I don't know, a million and a half dollars or something. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and they burned through their funding in like six months because they just hired a shit ton of people. Um, and then the project was canceled. Right. <laughs> and it's like, it, it makes it really easy to sort of throw these pie in the sky ideas out there because the, the more grand it sounds and the more convincing you are about it, right. about the, like your confidence in doing it, uh, the more willing people are to give you money. But you know, it does, well, it, me- it means like yeah. you can operate well outside of your actual personal limits. Yeah, because yeah, on the yeah, on those exact same lines, because it democratizes the process, which isn't a bad in, at all inherently a bad thing. It's, it's, it's actually it a adds, thing. to me. It adds a separate set of constraints that people I think don't necessarily. You know, it's it's the whole like stepping out of the frying pan into the fire. Like it, you're in. Yeah, well, it allows it allows basically two ignorant parties mm-hmm. to to sort of believe that something can be accomplished that actually neither of them really know anything about or could accomplish, right? Because. Because there's going to be typically... You're saying, are you saying worst case, though? In the worst case, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it allows for that to happen. It allows it's for, not... That's not what's always Well, it's not happens. even allows for it to happen. It's ma- It makes it easy to happen. Yeah. And, and this is why... Because it, it, whether it's just a matter of scope, which I don't think that was only, the only problem here, uh, but it's mostly a matter of like just what a realistic goal for that thing is, mm-hmm. right? Because if you have... like take, take Double Fine Studios. If they go to do a Kickstarter and say, hey, we want to crowdfund a game... You can believe they're going to make a game. Sure. And, and they've, done, the it, end, they've maybe, done it a lot. Yeah. yeah. And they've done it a few times. And in the end, like, of course, some handful of people are really angry about it. But That's the overall, <laughs> yeah, overall, <laughs> if they come to us and they say, we, we, you know, we have a track record of making games. They've made some of the best games and they kickstart it. All the people who fund it love games and believe in their studio. And that can come together and work really amazingly. But you can also have somebody who's never made a game ever who makes a really great pitch like the one that you just yes, described yep. and they make that pitch to an audience who are not game developers. Mm-hmm. They're just people who love video games and would love to see that that vision come true. And if, and if this person is a well-known person who's yeah. accomplished, people right. aren't thinking, this guy's never made a game. No. They're just <laughs> thinking, so they can't evaluate I like this it. guy. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. And so it's the same reason that you have all these people who are unvaccinated, right? Is because they look at somebody who they respect for some reason. That person spouts something that they have no right spouting anything about that's right we just linked kickstarter to anti-vaxxers you heard it here, <laughs> you heard it here first folks. you're welcome internet uh, yeah actually so I, I do like kickstarter yeah but i i like it for hardware based projects yes i like i mean yeah I, so things I, that require material goods because those are so expensive to produce that if someone has already prototyped it mm-hmm. and they just need they funding just, they to need, generate yeah. it that to me like that's the perfect absolute perfect use for kickstarter because you can you can believe it has a chance of coming to fruition although of course we there are many examples of it not but the problem there is very obvious and precise and it's about money that's the problem yes they've got the product ready to go they just yeah. have no means of they ha- they can't pr- they don't have produce- a whole right. bunch of it. But I think there are so many problems that are up on Kickstarter where they're basically taking an unsolved problem and saying, we want you to give us money so that we can solve this problem. Maybe. But it's not solved yet. Yeah. You get a sweet t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. And anytime you have an unsolved problem and there's so much unknown, then you just never know if it's actually yeah. going to I think the interesting out. thing about it is I think a lot, of, a lot of creatives and a lot of artists, artists in particular, approach either Kickstarter or Patreon as platforms through which they don't have to sell what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's it's such an erroneous way of thinking. I think it often leads to to a trap where people get into it thinking that it's gonna like it's gonna go really well. I mean, you see a lot if you go look at Patreon, like the the general power curve you're gonna see on Patreons is is immense. Like you have Yeah, the people, vast, vast majority make probably less than ten bucks a month. Yeah. And you can't just put it up there and then not talk about it. You can't not it's it basically the reason I the one thing I think it bothers me about both the platforms is I think people don't necessarily have a mature sense of what it means. To, to actually successfully be on this platform well, because it, yeah. for both of them they actually require they require as much selling of the thing you're doing as if you were to actually be able to put it in a storefront to go back to, to last week's episode mm-hmm. it actually allows you to it's it's it can be seen as and I'm not saying this is how it always works by any stretch but it can easily be used as a self handicapping mechanism because sure. it's so easy to start a Patreon it's less easy but fairly easy to start a Kickstarter not, not get one to work but to start one just to put one up to put one up and uh, and then doing so feels like you've done something really legitimate, mm-hmm. right? And you're taking, it seems like you've taken a big step. It seems perhaps. like you've taken a big Make step. Make a couple Facebook fact, posts, put out some backer yeah. updates, boom. Right. 
when in fact when you're in fact, invisible. Yeah, you're Still. you're completely invisible, and that step alone, you shouldn't even consider actually part of the process. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the conduit by which you pull in money for whatever the thing is, but it's not the platform. Is that even the way yeah. to say it? Yeah. Uh, like treating it as a platform for selling your idea or for raising money or whatever is actually the wrong. Perhaps. And so, so, then it, so then it allows you to put it up and be like, oh, I'm just, I'll just see how I can do. And then if you make 10 bucks a month, you can say, yeah, you, you, well, I just, yeah, I didn't put much yeah. work I into think it. The other right? thing that, that I find very interesting about, about Kickstarter in general is that I think it, it has a sort of a depressive, it can have a depressive effect on, on people when they don't make it. Yeah. When in reality, and there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of factors that go into like not making a Kickstarter go. And one of the big ones is setting your price correctly, right? Because of course, yeah. in Kickstarter, you don't get any of the money. It's different than Indiegogo, which of course you get however much you raise. But with Kickstarter, if you, if it's the case that you sort of like overblow how much money you think it's going to cost to do something, if it's the case that you do that with your own money, right? So there's no Kickstarter involved. You have the X amount of dollars that you think you need need and then you actually spend say a third of it and get the project done that's a huge win and you feel like a million bucks if it's the case that happens on kickstarter you're fucked right and i think that's there's nothing really, and so there's that whole another edge to it where like you have to be really good actually at at the production side of getting the work completed and know actually exactly what your costs are because if you don't you have two edges to fail on there one is asking for way too much when you don't need that much and the other one is actually asking for too little and both of those happen a lot yeah. and i think that's the thing is like when you're so approaching kickstarter these platforms, isn't even Efficient if you were lucky enough to have it right or or it's the case that you're you asked just for like an overblown amount and i think that's the interestingly dangerous thing to me is because you're 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 asking people who again are the people who who make the thing they're the artists uh they're the the game makers whatever else they're the people who who their whole job is to make the thing not to think about selling it and so when you have to put a price tag on the whole experience suddenly in my opinion they're not necessarily the most experienced people at putting an appropriate price tag on that which introduces just a whole nother a whole nother vast realm of risk to the operation that I think well and not only that but it, it also see. adds it has a an entire new dimension to selling a thing so like if you make a game on Kickstarter mm-hmm. uh and you want to raise the funds for it, it's not the same as developing the game and then just selling it. Because when like when we sell copies of Crashlands, we don't also need to, you know, mail somebody a t-shirt or yeah. send them a signed poster yeah. or like promise to put them in the credits. Like we just send them the game, the end, no no extra personal time goes into sure. it other than making the game. With Kickstarter, with the way that backer rewards tend to be set up, you know, it's it's I think it's a dangerous thing in the sense of people can really screw it up. Oh, yeah. It could add. I mean, it adds a lot of it not just adds a lot of logistics overhead that you can screw up just with that. It's just human hours. But yeah, but yeah. even even the thing and it like, cuts a lot of your money out. From yeah, money. there's there's tons of uh, uh, post mortems on on something like Gama Sutra and just like around the internet for different projects where people promise things in their backer rewards that they then by by producing them ended up eating into their ability to finish the project right because like they needed to make the shirt and they end up making the shirt in order to appease the backers rather than making the product at the end of the day and then they run out of cash so there's like and I I love the idea. I think it's it's the same thing where it's just it's another actually very hard thing to do correctly, and you see that by just the raw numbers. And I can't remember what the percentage of actual Kickstarter projects I get back, but it's like thirty percent or something like that. It's only like a third. Yeah, it's not that high. And it then probably only, goes down every month. Yeah, and then only about a fifth. It's of the those, Kickstarter apocalypse. Yeah, <laughs> and then <laughs> only like a fifth of those actually come to fruition at, at any point. Like they that actually get finished. And so obviously it's super hard. And I think when people approach it with a sort of nonchalance, like they could just put their thing up either on, on Kickstarter or on Patreon, it it well, it's not, not going to go. But yeah. nonchalance isn't even. I mean, you can approach it very seriously, but if you approach it wrong, <laughs> well, yeah, sure. it's, yeah, there, it, there's yeah, a it's, million ways to do it wrong, uh, and and then just end up with nothing. And, and I think I think we're all saying we're all we're all basically agreeing that there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these. And in fact, oh, yeah. it's great that they are options. It's just real easy to fuck it people. up. It's just really easy to <laughs> fuck it up and to interpret that the wrong way. Yes, yeah. to fuck it up and then be like, oh, I guess this is worthless. Well, yeah. I mean, like a great example would be you know if you have like let's say you have a, a reward tier at like 50 bucks or something and then you're like I'm going to add another tier at 75 and you get a t-shirt if you back at 75 but if that it, t-shirt costs probably $15 to produce yeah, it costs you 15 bucks to produce the shirt another 5 bucks to ship it the price difference for you between a $55 and $75 backer is $5 right yeah. and now, and now you have to do, do all this work. extra work to get this t-shirt put together you yeah. know like there's so many pitfalls in just putting these campaigns together. That well, not only that, but if you, but the rewards can compete with each other. Right. You know, because yep. like if you offer different things in different tiers, 
because if you have like limited items, if you or put whatever, them in the wrong order, if you put people them in the wrong the, order, people want the first one. Yeah, then they may yeah. go with a cheaper one instead of the more expensive one or, or whatever. Because the it has nothing to do with the actual thing that you're selling. Long story yeah. short, yeah. selling stuff is hard, and, and it's Kickstarter, even harder on Kickstarter. You're selling <laughs> tiers of stuff, which is even harder. Tiers of a th- tiers of things unrelated to a project for a project that isn't even done yet. Yeah. Shit's stressful, yo. Yeah. Okay, we're going to wrap up with a few quick questions. So we have some very quick snippets I want to dive into. Quick snips. Uh, the first one is just a science fact from an anonymous podcast listener Ooh. who says, if you laid out all the arteries and veins in your body end to end, you would die. That's right. I how, feel like, wait, is this how, from one of our games? Where is this from? This is a commonly heard joke. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we might have used it. Joke. <laughs> it's quite possible. Like, I've, I've heard this joke numerous times, but I mean, I like it. But yeah. All right, science, that's not man. necessarily true because Aren't it depends how slowly you lay them out. It's kind of like that question of <laughs> if you like if you replace one brain cell at a time mm. with a robot. What's it? This cell? is a boat. This is a what's the boat? The boat analogy. There's like a philosophy. I don't term know for where this. you're going. I don't know where you're going with. It's, it's a boat thing. Okay. Anyway, carry on. Okay. So, <laughs> so if you've got a boat, the ship of Theseus. Is that right? I, d- yeah. I still don't know what you're talking about. Odysseus is adventure the <laughs> killing of the Cyclops. Wait, let me let me collect you this. May, you may have Ship to elaborate. Ship of Theseus. On this. It's just the point is if you replace <laughs> yeah. if you replace all the parts slowly, then it's the same thing or what? Yeah, I don't, that, know that that is. Is. I don't know what, that what is. What does it have to do with arteries and veins? Though we're not oh, replacing. Yeah. So it's the same idea is like there's something about like if you were just to duplicate a person's brain, okay, and then take their brain out and put that one in, you'd be like you just murdered that person and put a copy of their brain in there, right? Right. Technically, but I guess if they were awake, <laughs> if they were awake and you slowly just replaced one cell at a time. It depends so on that, how much pain they're having during the, yeah, the yeah. course of the thing. But, they're not there to remember it. But <laughs> we're going to sum it up over time and nice. let it okay. end on a low note. Okay. So they'll feel great about it. Sounds great. And then you've basically gone from the same starting and finish conditions, but it doesn't really feel like you've murdered that person and replaced their brain with a robot. That's true. So what I'm saying is this is the same problem. So you should just slowly If you slowly murder. start un, you know, pulling out and unwinding and laying out a person's blood vessels, okay. if you do it slowly enough... <laughs> Then, then it they hurts won't die. forever. <laughs> then they won't die. I don't know if that Just, follows. If you take it to an, this is this is the beauty of calculus. But We're you're the in, biology, you know, PhD. Yeah. So I'm, gonna, so trust I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take I'm that gonna on faith. My doctorate to back this up. Appeal right? to authority. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question. Uh, from Racing for the Finish. If you would be able to bottle and sell your particular brew of sass, what would it taste like? Sarsaparilla. Some good stuff. Done. Done. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. I want this to be a quick one. Let's make it quick. Do you think VR will ever become something everyone has, or will it just die down until it's forgotten? Nope False dichotomy. No. Flag on the play. Nice. Uh, uh, <laughs> next question comes from Tim Conceivable in episode 47 you talk a bit about having formal education or training do you feel that formal education or training in general actually helps or hinders people I think people hinder themselves and they need to just quit giving a fuck again okay, listen to John nice. and Joey's I don't give a fuck is that right yeah. education can only help you in so much as you help yourself Whoa. oh my god it's like god <laughs> Is it though? There's that is saying, it? right? God helps those who help themselves. Oh yeah, which is which also he do it's also a way of saying he just chills out. <laughs> <laughs> and so does educa- education, like God, just chills out. Yeah, it's all on you. It's you nice to have, out. but really, you just got to do shit yourself. All right, two questions left. Uh, next one is from anonymous. Again, he's got really high quality questions here. Anonymous is crushing. Have it you today. ever messed with Game Maker's 3D? No, because that would be dumb. All right, moving on. Next question is from Dumbroski, who asks, "How important would you say it is for you guys to go to game expos and conventions? And what are some that you felt you benefited from being a part of?" Uh, I mean, we kind of touched on this in the past. It's only important if you know exactly why you're going there and accomplish that. And as long as that reason isn't a bad one. Yes. Right. Generic. And then the as second, fuck. but the yeah. second part <laughs> is, I, but, but the best we've gotten out of it is meetings with other developers because then we just met cool people. That's generally what you should use it for is for and meeting business other business contacts and business people. Yeah. yeah. If you're like, I'm gonna go to GDC because they have great parties. Dude, I mean, that's just, fine, but... Or if you're like, I'm going to go to Indie PopCon to meet Markiplier. And yeah. soak in the sights of Indianapolis. Number one, that's not actually going to end up happening. Yeah. Number two, if it does, it's going to take you 70 hours of waiting in line. Yeah. Both both of those things will. Yeah. We're not seeing the sights of Indianapolis. Though. That's pretty easy. It's good. They got that great town square. The cent- cir- yeah. It's a square. Square circle. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually a great time to say, uh, we will be going to Indie PopCon. 
Um, oh yeah. Sometime. When is that? It's coming up in the middle of June. Soon. Google it. Six weeks. Because I don't have the dates on here. So Google it yourself. Now uh, Car- Carol will be coming with us, right? Maybe. maybe. She has to figure out some timing on some stuff. So we'll mm, be okay. receive she's more flexible on that. So okay. uh yeah, if you want to actually meet us in person, you can go to Indie PopCon. It is in Indianapolis. This will be our second year going. And since we won an award there last year, we got a big old booth. So we're gonna have our game set up. We're gonna have some t-shirts. If you missed the t-shirt runs, which by the way is done now uh you can actually buy one from us there and we probably will bring posters maybe maybe we haven't figured that out yet but we're gonna work on it and you can come and hang out slap us in the f- in the <laughs> <laughs> i almost okay. said face we're, we're yeah, gonna have no a slapping in the face we're palm. gonna have a slap booth Sla- to be clear do palm not slap slaps. me in the face palm slaps i will send you right to jail yeah and, and honestly <laughs> so indie PopCon is weird this year because last year we went because we were promoting crashlands Mm-hmm. And this time we're just going because we're just gonna go hang uh, out. Which you know, like we had just talked about, if you don't have a good, <laughs> <laughs> terrible reason, to if you go. don't have a good reason to go, no, then no, no, you shouldn't. no, no, no. We're going well, just cause, but mostly because we want to meet the same devs that we met last year and meet a few more because they're trying to grow this whole like indie game dev. Yeah part of this of this festival and because who can pass up a free booth right guys yeah oh yeah yeah all right and uh the last one is that we have a panel tonight technically on the night of this podcast yeah well if you're (laughs) yeah we put the date earlier (laughs) which was we're recording this on may 3rd it will be live on may 4th so the you, night of May 4th. If you assume, yeah. if you go... If the 4th be with you. Oh, yes. This is the 4th be with you night. The uh, there's a marketing your game and selling your game panel, uh, which I believe is at Riot, maybe, Science Center, I don't know. It's on the... If you Google the St. Louis Game Dev Co-op, you can find the event on there, and we will be on the panel along with a bunch of other cool devs from St. Louis talking about how to market and sell your games, which we kind of touched on today. So if you want to come learn some stuff, again, give us the old palm slapper. Then but not face slaps. Not the face And as we oh, discussed shit, wait, earlier. Is it tomorrow night? Yeah. I'll actually you can go. There. Adam will be there. Yeah. That's so weird. I actually wasn't even planning on being here this week, but then I decided it was the right move. But so I'll I, say I you should definitely come if you want to learn stuff, because as we discussed earlier, the more stuff you learn, the slower you die. Yep. <laughs> and with that... <laughs> With that, thanks for listening to Coffee with Butterscotch. As always, if you want to catch up on podcasts or ask a question for next week, go to podcast.bscotch.net. Otherwise, shut up and die slower. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.